Spartan, I'm one of the founders of SparkCon. And I'm Erica Porter, lead organizer for Fashion Spark. And we're pretty stoked this year. It's the seventh year we're having SparkCon, and it's growing, growing, growing. The grassroots festival of creativity is really taking hold. And this year we actually get to show our stuff at an opening ceremony at the Raleigh Downtown Amphitheater, now dubbed the Red Hat Amphitheater, and it's an all-free show. And that's Thursday night? It's Thursday night oh, at the amphitheater. We're going to have 11 local designers. They're going to show their goods. They're going to have local music. And it's just going to be really awesome. So the fashion show starts at what time? 8 o'clock. At 8 o'clock. Yeah. But, the, but the opening ceremony is Thursday. Is... It starts at 6 and goes all the way to 10.30. And you're going to see like a real tasting of all the things that are going to be happening at SparkCon during the weekend. So from 6 to 10.30, you get a real taste of all of SparkCon. That's great. It's a really sprawling event, folks. There's so much going on. Thank you. Thank you. Executive Director of Visual Art Exchange. We're the organization that oversees SparkCon. I'm Sarah Corcoran. I'm the Programs Director at Visual Art Exchange, and we are the team behind all of the big logistical SparkCon craziness. <laughs> we're pretty excited. We, in our jobs, we get to see all the behind the scenes stuff. We know where tents go, we know who's fundraising and who's not, we know who's coming to everything, and we've definitely been through all ups and downs with the organizers. So at this point in time, we're really excited because all the activities are starting to take shape, all the organizers are getting really excited, and we're starting to know which artists are going to be out and about for the weekend. We also That's get great. the inside scoop on like all the fun activities that we want to get to early because we know they're going to be crowded. <laughs> yeah. so. And also we have Razor scooters, so yeah. we can get to all these activities <laughs> very quickly. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. And you guys can just transform downtown. You transform Fayetteville Street. You, it's really an amazing event. And I think that's the best part. One of our interns a couple years ago said the best thing about it was that artists took over the city. And I think that really sums up what I love about it. Just it's a regular street. Business people walk up and down. But we take it over. For All weekend. Days. It is ours. All I weekend. It's ours. Yeah. And I think for me it's the kind of controlled feeling of randomness. Yeah. It's it lo You show up. You don't know anything about it. And it, it's like you just stepped into the most random world where you're going to walk past aerial silk dancers and fire spinners and skateboarders and then a DJ and then a acoustic musician and some kids activities and street painters and the list just goes on but it's actually really under control everything's been planned out for months and they're the ones who do so, it <laughs> you know it's like this weird world where it seems crazy but there's actually you know a sense to the madness right and then there's all these surprises too and that's the most fun for everyone who comes, is you don't know everything you're going to see. There's not just one theme, there's not just one type of event, it's everything. Right. And I'm constantly surprised. Like, we just had a meeting and someone will say something that's happening, and I'm like, I totally didn't know it was happening, I have to go to it, you know, it's going to be cool. So come down and discover what is SparkCon this year. My mic is up. My mic is up. I really want to thank the, um, the SparkCon folks. Yeah, a charmingly amateurish, right? And that's what we are here at Monkey Time. But really, I know you all are tired from hopscotch last weekend. A lot, everyone is. But um, SparkCon is, is uh, it predates hopscotch. This is their seventh year. And it's, it's a really cool homegrown arts festival. And they take over Fayetteville Street. There's street um, uh, painting, street art all over with uh, chalk all over some really amazing pieces. That's just the, that's the backdrop, Carol. The backdrop is everywhere you look. There's pods, art pods, these long, you know, storage pods that people can live in now <laughs> that we're all going to be living in <laughs> in the next 10 years. But, you know, um, with art installations in them all up and down Fayetteville Street, there's music, there's uh, Geek Spark. I didn't get a chance to show everybody who I filmed at their last meeting Monday, but Geek Spark down at the fish market, they're doing some amazing interactive art installations. It's all happening starting tomorrow night, Thursday, um, and moving on. Thursday the what? 13th? Yeah, today's the 12th. Thursday the 13th, starting uh, um, at the Red Hat Amphitheater, downtown Raleigh's new amphitheater. Um, and the fashion show is always great, Carol. Fashion show is always great. Starts at 8. The opening ceremony is from 6 to 10, 10.30, something like that. And the fashion show is right at 8. It's free, and it's just really a lot of fun. 
Um, there's also um, Wheel Spark, which is a bunch of skating skaters and uh, skate demonstrations and uh, all kinds of neat, neat skater-related stuff. So come on down to SparkCon. I'm very excited for them. Um, and thanks uh, to all the folks that, uh, that let me film them on Monday. Um, OK, so um, we've got to talk about, can we put up uh, whatever the caption is there? Oh, can I uh, remind me, Carol, about New Music Raleigh? Okay, so before we go to the break, or before we uh, end the show, remind me to talk Sunday night, there's a concert that if you're at all even slightly interested in experimental and odd and intelligent, unusual music, you really ought to go. It's only 10 bucks. Um, and New Music Raleigh, remind me, Carol. Thank you. All right, so we gotta talk about this Libya crap, right? So um, y'all have probably heard that there were major protests in Egypt earlier this week, right? They took down the American flag and put up a, a black flag over our embassy. And this is, you know, Egypt, you know, the Arab Spring, you know, we were all gunning for them. You know, what's up? What's going on here? Um, it's a good question. And then in Libya, in the town where we, um, uh, that we liberated and br or, or we helped protect from Gaddafi, right, there was a major attack on the embassy and our ambassador, who apparently, Carol, was really liked by a lot of the Libyan people. He was really, he was the kind of politician that Mitt Romney wouldn't like. That yellow on yellow is totally not working, is it? <laughs> it changed the color to black. <laughs> Why did I wear a yellow t-shirt? Should I take off my shirt, Carol? Because I have enough hair on my chest that I think the contrast would work, no? Carol, we should switch shirts. Oh my God, well, okay, well, well, it's too late now. But you'll just have to squint, monkeys. You'll just have to squint. But really, it's okay, because Carol's lesbian and I'm gay. So, you know, so there would be nothing untoward going on. Although I did just tell someone the other night that I was mostly gay, Carol. Yeah, and you know what? I really meant it. And I think we, we both decided that, that, uh, that um, if there was enough ecstasy involved, all bets are off, man. <laughs> you know, it's all about the cuddle puddle, right? All right, so anyway, what am I talking about? Oh, yeah, so why is this happening? Well, um, it looks like now, the two, there are two separate things, the Egypt thing and the Libya thing, right? The Egypt thing was just a protest. It was the standard fundamentalist Islamists stirring up trouble protest because in free speech America, people are allowed to be really rude about religion. And I kind of like that. Raise your hand if you like that in America you're allowed to be rude about religious idiots. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like that. I'm not going to back down on that. But the story of the movie that caused this outrage is really fascinating. Now, I just had a major computer crash earlier this evening, so I haven't been able to update my Twitter page yet with direct links, but there's some fat, the story's just moving a mile a minute. This movie, a trailer for this movie that is vehemently anti-Muhammad, it's a total, you can call it satire, but you're doing it a favor. By call, it's a horribly made, stupid, awful, just this 14 minutes of Muhammad uh, as a homosexual, as a, a pedophile, um, saying that, uh, calling a donkey that the first, uh, the first uh, uh, Muslim, you know, just, just have you watched this thing, Carol? You haven't seen it? You need to watch this ridiculously amateurish 14 minute video. This gets posted by an Egyptian American Coptic Christian. This is one of these fundamentalist Christian sects Coptic, I, I mean, fundamental is probably the wrong word, but Coptic Christians are oppressed by uh, Muslims in the Middle East, or in, in many areas of the Middle East. And he's an Amer Egyptian American who hangs out with Terry Jones down in Florida, the preacher who was the Koran burning guy, right? And they know that all they have to do to make huge protests and violence is, is to, you know, go ahead and do something that vehemently, violently, aggressively insults Islam. We all know this by now, right, Carol? It's not pleasant, and it's a part of the negotiation between Islam versus the West that we're going to have to, which is a stupid framing, but fundamentalist Muslims versus more enlightened people, Muslims and non-Muslims both, really have to have this ongoing conversation. It's going to take decades before we get to the point where we're allowed to say Muhammad is not divine without you killing us. That's just it. And you have to get over that. Now, what do we have to do? Well, perhaps we shouldn't. 
publicize films and send the links out to Egyptian journalists that show Muhammad calling an ass, a donkey, the first Muslim. Uh, you know, whatever, you can do whatever you want, but this was a deliberate provocation. And he got, you know, this Egyptian-American Coptic Christian guy who hangs out with Terry Jones, the Florida pastor who's the, flat, the Koran burning guy. They, he got what he wanted. He spread this out on his uh, email lists and posted it on YouTube and said that Terry Jones was going to have a show this movie and have a trial of Muhammad on September 11th. This was last week. That's what started all this. Are we clear, Carol? Am I being, am I being, a lot of times people don't, don't, I jump in on the story because I've been absorbing this stuff all day and this is a fast moving story, monkeys. But what started the Egyptian protest and the Libyan attack on, well, that's more complex. But there was a Libyan protest and then what looks like an Al-Qaeda attack on the Libyan embassy in the town that we defended from Gaddafi. Well, you and I didn't do it. You know what I'm saying. Our, the troops did it. You know, we sent people there to do that, right? Well, we, you know, we helped. <laughs> they defended their town, but we helped. All right. And Gaddafi's gone, right? What started it? What started it was last week, this Egyptian-American guy who's now disappeared, very curious, said we've made, you know, somebody made this film. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. The Egyptian-American is just the guy who promoted it. Said this guy made this film. And it was, it was horrible. There's a 14-minute clip on YouTube. You can, you can go, go watch. The guy who made the film turns out didn't tell any of the actors or actresses that he was making an anti-Islam film. He told them he was making a film about Egypt 2,000 years ago. And if you look at the clips that are available online, every time an actor or actress says something anti-Muhammad, the word Muhammad is dubbed in after the fact, Carol. The actors and actresses who were hired to make this movie were not told that they were making an anti-Islam movie. The footage was taken back to Final Cut Pro somewhere, maybe even RTN. No, 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 don't come bomb in the stu studio. Um, I'm just kidding, but fi that's what we use here at RTN, Final Cut Pro. The footage was taken back, and this guy and his team or whatever inserted the anti-Muhammad stuff over, and the actors and actresses have now released a public statement. I think there were 80 of them, Carol saying we had no idea. And one of the things that this guy behind this movie, who has now disappeared, and it turns out the name he gave to the Wall Street Journal and the Associated Press yesterday is not a real person at all. This guy was telling the Wall Street Journal yesterday, oh yeah, I got $5 million in funding, and this is what started all this. I got $5 million in funding um, you know, from about 100 wealthy Jews. And now this guy, his name doesn't exist. There's nobody by that name in either. He said, oh yeah, I'm an Israeli businessman, he says. Israel has said there is nobody by that name in Israel. The United States and, and reporters have not found any record of anybody by that name in the United States. The guy's disappeared. After dropping this bomb on the world, lying to the actors and actresses, dubbing in anti-Muhammad stuff, then telling the Wall Street Journal and the Associated Press that 100 wealthy Jews donated his $5 million so he could make this movie, which is ridiculous, it's a joke. Nobody spent $5 million on this movie if you look at the, the clips that are available online. Muhammad Innocent or Innocent Muhammad or something like that. I forget what it's called. Now this guy's disappeared. This guy. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very much in favor of free speech. But Carol, this guy's a dick. This is like shouting fire in a theater. This is like shouting fire in a crowded movie theater, Carol said from the back there. It's close. Yeah. I still say he has a right to, to make this kind of movie, but if he doesn't get sued, I will be very, by the actors and actresses who are using this, I will be very, very surprised. This is not responsible First Amendment behavior. Now, I can hear my friend Michael already laughing. 
<laughs> you know, I mean, I, all right, respond, what is responsible First Amendment behavior? And he, he would laugh and say, why are you so conservative right now? You know, <laughs> but okay, fair enough. Uh, usually I don't give a crap. You have First Amendment rights and you have every right to do what you want. But this is a really strange case. Now, this movie got publicized to Egyptian journalists last week. What's going to happen with this? Well, a right-wing fundamentalist Egyptian cleric with a TV show, Carol, <laughs> imagine a non-gay fundamentalist Muslim me instead of an atheist. Non-gay, non-atheist, fundamentalist Muslim who probably doesn't even use monkey puppets on Egyptian television showing this clip. Now, what do these right-wing fundamentalist Muslims need most? They want power. What gets their audience going? They have insulted our God. They, we know this already. So this shows up on Egyptian television, right? This Muslim cleric, who's a, a long time uh, far right wing Islamist, right? Shows the clips and incites people to protest and bam, suddenly there are crowds around the Egyptian embassy. This is how it happened, to the best of my knowledge. It's a quickly moving story. I just found out, like two hours ago, about the actors and actresses releasing a statement saying that they were completely lied to in the making of this film, and he used them to make this kind of vaguely Egyptian ancient history movie. You know, and you're an actor or actress, Carol, you're desperate, right? <laughs> you know, and, and so, you, yeah, I mean, you want to act in a movie. Who cares how bad it is? We all know actors do the B-movie thing. You know, it's kind of sad sometimes, but these are, these are you know, there's a couple of mid-level B, B actors in this, but mostly it's a bunch of unknowns. He lies through his teeth to them, dubs over this vehemently anti-Islam, deeply, uh, just, just atrociously offensive garbage, which I respect his right to do that, but why would you do that? What's the end game there? Well, I'm starting to wonder, Carol, who he's connected to. Who benefits if there's an increase in violence in the Arab world? Who is this guy? Well, we're going to find out. There's no way he's going to be able to keep hiding. Somebody told me, emailed me uh, earlier today that the FBI has probably already got his hand, their, its hand up his ass. <laughs> he just doesn't know it yet. <laughs> the FBI is probably like, okay, whose turn is it to go pick up this, the, the, the fugitive, you know? <laughs> well, what, what, I mean, uh, don't you want to know who this idiot is? So now, that's what happened in e Egypt. What happened in Libya? This is where Mitt Romney has completely screwed up. What do we got, 20 minutes? All right, real quick, real quick. No digressions. The same crowd had a similar crowd had a, a, a protest at the American Embassy. At that point, the American Embassy tweeted out a conciliatory statement saying, look, we don't appreciate this. They're surrounded by a crowd. We don't appreciate what this guy did. We find this, you know, what we, First Amendment speech is great, but we don't support, we reject any deliberate attempts to offend anybody based on religion. That was the tweet that Mitt Romney seized on to paint Obama as sympathetic to, to Muslims. That was the tweet that Mitt Romney, the night it happened, while the, the, the attack was going on, right? While we're still trying to figure out what happened, Mitt Romney comes out last night and says, Obama is, is sympathetic to the Muslims. We should not apologize for this. And the right-wing media pick up on it, right? That was a tweet from inside the U.S. compound that was surrounded by people. And Obama has today given an interview where he said, look, I understand why they would do that. They're trying to defuse the situation. You got to cut them a little slack. They're in the middle of a tense situation. And they send out this tweet, and now Romney's trying to use that, tried to use that. It didn't work. People were appalled. Now, maybe I'm only, I'm trying to read right-wing and left-wing sites, but, but, you know, Peggy Noonan was appalled. She was Ronald Reagan's speechwriter. What's his name? Uh, the guy that wrote, um, uh, was it Dispatches? Or who was McCain's uh, main advisor, one of his main campaign advisors? Mark something or other. I forget, I forget his name. He said this was a mistake. And Obama's played it very cool. And this is making Mitt Romney look like a, like a, like a, a partisan political idiot.
everybody's making politics out of this. But the point is that Obama's statement had already gone out talking about how nothing, uh, uh, by the time Mitt Romney put out his little statement, Obama's statement superseding the, the like scared tweet from our embassy had already gone out saying nothing excuses this kind of violence, right? Wait, I think I'm getting the, the timeline a little confused. Yeah, anyway, at this point they're surrounded and then here's what happens. Most of the crowd goes away. Then a second wave hits with rocket grenade launchers, right, Carol? This is where the current theories now, and it's all very fast moving, is that this was the Al-Qaeda group that had already been planning an attack, maybe on 9-11, because we just killed a major um, Al-Qaeda guy last week, Carol, in Yemen. Did you know that? Yeah, the United States just killed a major Al-Qaeda guy last week in Yemen. And there was a video posted recently from an Al-Qaeda guy saying, avenge this guy. So maybe this attack was already pre-planned. Maybe they saw this stupid movie and the protest it caused and said, well, now would be a good time to do that because we've got this huge inflamed sentiment we can take advantage of. And so it looks like that's what happened, is after that first wave of protesters and that tweet from the embassy, then came the second wave. And that's when the RPGs were, were, were fired. That's when, and not only that, but after the first wave, we moved our diplomat, our ambassador, and, and his staff to a safe house. The second wave came right at that safe house, Carol. This is my vague understanding of what happened. The second wave came right at that safe house. And that is when our ambassador was killed. And, a, and a f other people, four other people at least. Or, you or, yeah, I would like to calm down and play a song. Anyway, the point is, we'll talk next week about, about this new book about what Bush knew about 9-11 and what it means for conspiracy theories. But the point is, Romney really screwed up on this. He really showed, and you know, I'm, not to, I'm trying not to be partisan here, he really showed just a complete lack of understanding of how delicate these situations are. The very night that it happened, he's already, Wait. of the day that it happened, he's already releasing. Um, attacks. All right. Okay. We'll we'll uh, we'll see you next week. Rain is falling and it's after dark. The streets are swimming with the shark. And there ain't nothing around here to look at Move on Move on Neon lights on Baltimore Every shadow Getting famous. Some backyard in some plastic chair. We're hoping these cigarettes will save us. Here we go again. Uh, uh. Here we go.
back in my saw a band play in the basement across the path of a friend of mine didn't know what that look upon her face meant something's gone from her Yeah.